Thank you for, for coming back in a timely manner too. Um, we've got a few changes to the schedules and um, we're going to kick off with a panel discussion on artificial intelligence with Sean Murphy and Dr. Scott Hollier and I'll hand over to, uh, hand over to them now. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, my name's Sean Murphy. Um, I'm from Cisco Systems. Um, I'm also part of the Human Rights Commission Expert Reference Group for Human Interaction, sorry, Future Technology Project. Uh, and, and the whole project is focusing on technology of the future. AI uh, is one area that we're very heavily, that the, the HRC is very he, um, focusing on quite intensely because it's a major social impact. Uh, I was asked early in the year to talk about, uh, write a paper on accessibility and how it impact or benefit the disabled community. So I asked Scott to join in on that paper because I've seen him do, do another paper on IoT to get him to come and give us some information. So I'm just going to kick it off um, and I'll let Scott to introduce his bit about IoT in a second because I want us to set the foundation for AI. Now today is the more, uh, what we're doing is more of a fireside chat and we really just want to get your input as well at the end if we have time and hopefully we will. Okay, so I was going to use my computer but knowing technology and how things go, it died. And okay, so artificial intelligence. It is a hype, it's a real hype in the media today. I'm not going to talk about the theory behind artificial intelligence, I'm going to use an analogy, because I prefer analogies than actually talking about the heavy theory, because a lot of people get that. So when you're a kid, I pick you up, you're only one or two, you don't know the language, you don't know much at all, because your brain's a sponge, and you're learning things. I shove you in a dark room, envisage this, there's no windows, there's no lights. And I'm telling you, red, I show you a picture of blue. But I'm telling you it's red. I do that multiple times. Then I show you another picture. I show you a dog and I show you, and I'll tell you it's a cat. This goes on for a period of time. Then this young poor child that's been brainwashed by me, oh, that sounds good. Uh, <laughs> now I'm showing my evil side. Anyway. So what's happening, that kid comes out, you show them the colour blue, they'll say red. No, 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 hang on, that's blue. AI is like that. AI is just an algorithm that can make decisions via very smart software coding. You pump it heaps of data, it can just come up with a decision and make and give you some form of result. For example, if you're using something like uh, facial recognition, it can recognize that person. So I just want to use that analogy, if you give it the right data, you'll get the right results. If you give the bad data, you get the bad results. So I'm going to pass it over to Scott now, and he's going to talk about his favorite topic, IoT. Excellent. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, when Sean proposed this um, talk, he said, I'd really like to do a fireside chat. So I said, OK, well, you bring the questions and I'll bring the fire. So um, I have my little laptop next to me with um, uh, fireside, um, I think it's about an hour long YouTube video. I had no idea there were so many fireplace videos on YouTube, but I do now. Uh, so look, when it comes to um, Internet of Things, my background is I did a research project with Curtin um, in 2017, looking at how students um, and what they wanted from their education and how IoT might apply to it, um, which was a great research project to be involved in. Interesting thing with um, Internet of Things is that it was the, coin, the term was arguably coined by Kevin Ashton in 1999, and he made the point that big data is something that humans don't do very well. Um, we only have to see in elections that we often have to have recounts and things, because when we do try to count up big data, it's really tricky. So it makes sense to have things like sensors and actuators to um, deliver data, to then um, p compile it in a way that makes sense to us, that we can use. And that's really where the AI aspect comes in. We interact with our devices like Google Home or Amazon Echo 
And it feels like we can just ask things, but really what's going on is data is being pulled from all over the place and being put in a way that we can understand. I think one important thing to note, though, is that IoT and um, this whole concept of engaging with our devices isn't something new. Um, Dick Tracy comics have been having uh, what's arguably the smartwatch since the 1930s. So uh, next time you're in an Apple store and someone says, uh, look at our amazing new Apple watch, you can mention it. Actually, the concept's 80 years old, and I wish you all the best with that conversation. Um, so... Just um, to briefly touch on the education implications, um, there's quite a few things that uh, students have looked at uh, in terms of what they would like uh, in terms of AI. And one of the big ones that came out was that um, a number of students have said, look, the, the lecturer writes things up on a smart board um, and I have my device on me. Why can't the content from the smart board be converted into something that can come straight to my device or my learning management system? Um, so I can use my screen reader, I can use assistive technologies. So, um, and yeah, I mean, we have all the technology to do that. So this is just one of those um, ideas that came through in the research and does pose interesting questions about what we can do to uh, harness this technology to make it more accessible. Uh, Sean? So picking out what Scott has said, uh, I like to, I like, I'm a very simple guy, cynical but simple. So if you've got technology, and you're talking about AI. There's three ways AI I've seen from my research and searching around the net that's been applied for disabled people, specifically to the disabled person. So they, they, they get the AI, AI and they say, oh, this is a good solution. This is going to solve the disabled person's problems without consulting the disabled person in the first place, and they, re, and they produce a product. Then they have the disabled person finds a mainstream product and say, Oh, hell, that Google Echo, or, sorry, I just merged two products together. The Google Home and the Amazon Echo and other little similar products. I think, wow, I can't turn on the lights myself. I don't, I want to control my air conditioning. Now, this is stuff that you guys want, you do when you automate your home, they can do. So they're adapting main, mainstream products to become sister technology. Then you've got all the other crap out there, all the other mainstream tech stream technology that can that disabled person use? That's the question I'm throwing at you to think about. Can that technology that's based on AI, can they use? One thing I didn't mention in the AI component is there's three areas. The human interaction, the actual algorithms that do it and all the deep learning and the narrow learning and all the other theoretical models they use out there, and the data. So, I'm going to, at that point, I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to pass it back to Scott, and I want him to talk about education and get dig and expand upon that in a bit more depth. So once we done, once he's done his thing, I'm going to talk about consumer products, and so is Scott, and then we're going to move into more employment, and let, let's see where we go from there. Excellent, thanks, Sean. So. In terms of the students um, and their feedback, as I was saying, there was that one good example in terms of um, connecting a smart board to our everyday devices. There are a few other things that um, really came out uh, uh, in, the, in the literature and the feedback. And there have been some studies done where the, in real time, if we use the Internet of Things and some um, AI algorithms, as a lecturer is delivering um, a, um, a, a workshop or, um, or something, um, education related. Um, there was some studies done where devices regarding students attention and breathing and things like that were um, attached to the students and likewise something similar attached to the uh, lecturer and actually found that they could very closely monitor um, at what point students started to get a little dozy and um, stop paying attention and they could then in real time alert the lecturer to this happening and then that lecturer could start changing their approach to be more engaging. Um, and so this was um, another thing that was really interesting and the students in the research were very keen to see something like that take place. Uh, another suggestion by the students is around um, particularly people who are deaf and hearing impaired and uh, the use of things like uh, Google Home. Um, the students made the point that um, if you can dictate to your smartphone um, an SMS message and uh, easily uh, send that off, then why is it that um, we can't use something similar in the classroom to make sure that all our um, content is captioned? Um, is it possible for a lecturer to say, wear a microphone and have something like um, Google Home be able to uh, create real-time automated captions with a, with a reasonable accuracy and just have them immediately 
going up on the screen, or again, being sent straight to the device of a student who's hearing impaired. Um, and there's a lot of argument over how accurate automated captions are these days. Uh, but it's fair to say that if we do have the conditions set right, um, it can be a very powerful tool. And there are some unis doing some investigation into this already. But that's just a, a few examples of the education implications. There's also around um, navigating around campus. Um, if you um, ever try to navigate, or if you've ever seen Curtin University's um, wheelchair campus map, I think you'd just about need a hunting dog and a Ouija board to effectively uh, make it work for you. Um, but if you had the right technologies um, and um, more support around being able to get in and out of buildings um, with access, uh, using IoT and GPS navigating, then um, it's um, a lot more effective in uh, providing that support. And again, it's really about putting that, um, the layer of technologies around uh, and the AI to interact with them to make it work. Uh, Sean, back to you. So consumer technology, oops, yeah, I don't want to yell. Consumer technology, now we all like our gadgets. If, actually, question, does anyone not like their gadgets? So I have an Echo, Amazon Echo Home, and I've got other technology out there. And I've got my new washing machine, I've got my new hi-fi, and I come along as a disabled person, and I suddenly realise I can't use it. So IoT allows me, if it's done correctly, to interact with it. And I can just use that web interface like yourself. So I can start, like there's a new microwave out there by LG, which you can yell at, and say, go and cook my egg and watch it explode. Or go and make my donut so I can bounce it off the wall. All those sort of things I used to do when I was a young kid when microwaves came out. And I thought, great. But, you know, there's sort of things that we can do in consumer products. There's technology that people are using in wheelchairs to allow them to control their wheelchair. And they're using mainstream technology and they're using self-driving car technology to drive around. There's people who are are visually impaired who are using it to control the lights in the house and things of that nature for a consumer. There's, uh, there's other technology out there allowing the people to control their computers and they're just pulling some mainstream consumer type products off the, pro off the market and adapting to the way they want to do. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities out there and in some of the examples that, which were presented in the keynote speaker to, to this morning demonstrates that. There's people being innovative in trying to make, using this great possible technology, there's a downside. There's all, you know, technology has the positive and the negative. So some of the negatives in, due to the consumer side is privacy, biased data, I can't play to use it. So I'm a person going in internationally and I go up to a passport, a rec facial recognition machine, and I have a facial, dis 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 can't say the word now, I have a deformity in my face, I have a false eyes, and the technology, or I can't get that field of my eyes in the field at the square, little square on the screen to look into it so it can recognise me, and suddenly you can't use that technology. Suddenly there's a barrier for that person. So that's just one real life example that's out there. Scott, do you have any others in this sort of area? Well, I think it's worth just pulling together the fact that, as Sean said, there are just so many benefits um, more broadly. So, for example, you know, these, in this day and age, as long as my smartphone has an uh, internet connection, I don't have to worry about being lost. And as a legally blind person, that's... Um, Terrific, and even just for your everyday things. I mean, um, I'm in Sydney, and um, I like junk food. Maybe a little too much junk food, and um, but the great thing is that I can pull up my uh, an app on my phone, and um, I can go to food places. It will then tell me where the nearest food places are, and it can then navigate me to those food places. And the amount of data that has to come together to make all that possible is is quite remarkable. And there are those very practical needs. But as um, Sean mentioned, there, are, there is downside and privacy and security are big ones. I mean, if someone was malicious, it would be very easy to, um, to hijack me and uh, take me to a health food store or something. And, um, you know, it's, um, there, there are potentials to, um, to make things tricky. And, uh, you know, whilst I, I take it lightheartedly, um, you know, there could be malicious things. So, for example, if someone relied heavily on, um, med um, had a medical condition where um, the medicine had to be refrigerated at a particular temperature. It wouldn't be too hard to hack into a fridge, lower the temperature, uh, spoil the medicine, put it back to what it was, and you'd never know. And so there are, as we see all these great benefits uh, for the technologies, we also do have to be mindful that uh, unfortunately there can be sinister people out there and um, yeah, we need to always be vigilant in that area too. Scott, you just give me a new project to give you the health 
application <laughs> without you knowing. So if you're talking about an employment world, it's a big problem. Now, it's already been stated this morning, which is, which is beautifully aligned because I had no idea what, what the keynote speakers, Microsoft, David and, and co. were going to talk about. Employment is one of my passions, is that the disabled people in this country and around the world is not as much in the workforce as it could. There are articles out there saying, AI is going to make this whole revolution improvements. There is some software out there that which I've seen, which Salesforce and Google and Microsoft are producing and, and other companies are producing. And one of the technologies which really blew my mind away, which I can use, you can use, and people who have difficulty absorbing information, which it's primarily designed for, can use. It, it takes a whole news article and condenses it down to one paragraph or one line. So think about all that information you guys are receiving and you can condense that down even more. Another, some other technology I've seen which I was really excited about is sign language, or what I call the babelfish, but sign language that can interpret your spoken word and give that person who's deaf and only understands sign language because it's their na native language and they can start communicating with you without having that third person. Other technologies, you know Siri or Google Assist or Amazon Echo or the half a dozen other out there that are out there doing this sort of stuff, it's using AI behind it. Old voice recognition software didn't. It used a statistical model, but now they're moving to AI to make it much easier. Now I've had in my organization people asking me by my customers, is there any software out there that can translate from one language to another? So, yes, there is. There's software out there now people are working on to allow you to do voice recognition in a conference and bring it back into text. So this amazing stuff that's coming out there. Likewise, and the, um, the, 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 I call it the dark side. But anyway, on the dark side is that technology has a challenge if the human interaction for a disabled person isn't done right. Now, I'm talking to a lot of converted people here, but that's the message out there. If you are going to develop a new product and that product doesn't have the right human interaction, regardless what the product is, if it's in the middle of the street and it's an information chaos or it's a piece of so, a, la, a mobile app or a desktop app or a web app or whatever it is, if it's not properly designed and you're thinking of all the custom base, not the majority, Therefore, you're going to put barriers and the social change, which is our Discrimination Act is all about, will not occur. Scott. Yeah, just to build on that, um, a good example is the Amazon Echo Show, um, which has now made that screen uh, interaction um, in a way that supports people who are deaf or hearing impaired. So you can effectively access um, pretty much the same things that you could do verbally and receiving um, the verbal feedback you can now do by screen interactions and, um, and there are alerts that can flash on the screen and things like that to get your attention. Moving forward in the employment space, I mean it's not too far away where it's likely we could turn up into an office and uh, what greets us is something like uh, an Amazon Echo show as that, um, that initial greeting. So it's really important going forward that when we do consider access implications that we do make sure that whoever walks into that room and interacts with that device that um, all the functionality of that device can, can be accessed regardless of disability and so um, that will have profound impacts on um, our workplace and um, employment as time goes on. Yep. So the final question and uh, comment we're going to talk about is governance. We all like to be governed and you know controlled and regulated don't we? Or do we? Okay, so there are some gaps in our laws. In the DDA, there's some gaps in there in relation to technologies. Well, I, I'd argue if the DDA has done an effective job in improving our, in change, closing the gap for accessibility for the disabled community. Um, I would I, I'd argue our Telecommunication Act has it kept up. The USA in 2010 have done a major improvements in there. Uh, act to try and ensure that the disabled people are still included in the technology. I still think there's gaps there. Has our, are there are there other regulations and stuff in the, out there which should be reinforced to ensure that when a person with a disability, and think about it, and with some of the stats that came out yesterday, we all are, or hopefully 
we all don't, but some of us are going to end up with disabilities when we're older, and you want to go and use your favourite washing machine, and we don't have laws enforcing or incentives to encourage companies out there to do the right thing and making sure they're getting the full market. Not the 20, not the 80% of the market, the whole 70, whole 100% of the market. So that's the sort of things, you know, I, I feel very strongly that, you know, we have gaps in, and that's some of the stuff that the, um, the project that I'm involved with as a, on the reference group, they're looking into and seeing what can we do? How can we change the, pro the, the look at the different ways of improving things and trying to work out how can the governance or encouragements or whatever other processes we can do to try and close that gap for the accessibility and other areas that are related to the whole project, which I'm not going to take any funder from the presentation tomorrow. Anyway, on to that point, Scott, do you have anything you want else to add to that? I need to reiterate that uh, the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992 has no specific reference to ICT, and I think it's long overdue that that's, that's updated. So that's... Um that's something which I know uh, Sean and myself and uh, many people here have been uh, trying to um, to get addressed. And uh, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, the more we have these discussions, um, that will happen at some point. Now, sure. sorry, Sean and Scott, thank you very much for the presentation. We've just got one minute to go. Yeah. Well, perfect timing. I think that's it. Yes, that is it. That's the next thing is questions. So I'm going to I'm going to throw out there and think about and come and talk to us and talk about yourselves. Future technology, what do you think is over the horizon? So what I would like is a robotic dog like K-9 from Doctor Who. <laughs> exactly like K-9 from Doctor Who. Okay, we, have time for, we have time for one question, one question only, but Sean and Scott, you'll be around over lunch as well? Uh, yes, uh, yep. in the first bit of lunch, yes, I'll, be, I'll still be around. I'll be here all lunch. Great. Uh, we've, we have time for one question. Okay, uh, yes, yep. I still have 40 minutes of fire left, if, um, if anyone wants to enjoy that. Uh, yes, I was just going to say, of all of the technologies that are out there, and there are a lot, which do you consider is the most likely immediate um, improvement that you're going to see in the next couple of years? Conversation technology. So what I'm talking about is voice assist, but not what we've got. That's the next input fad. Um, and unfortunately, it's going, well, there are some p people in our community who are going to have challenges, but having that, this is what I see in the next 10 years. You'll walk up to your computer and you'll say to the computer, computer, give me the t stats from the sales uh, revenue for the last two years from these companies, da da da, and it'll, it'll pr produce a report to you. And that report could come in any fashion. Yeah. And just, just to throw my two cents as well, um, yeah, I think the, we're only just seeing the cusp of AI and IoT, so, you know, it's only really been with us in the, in, for, I mean, Amazon Echo came out in 2015, so we're very early days in uh, the evolution of that technology. Also, if anyone wants a copy of the Curtin University research, um, yeah, let me know, and I'm more than happy to get a copy of the report to you. Okay, thank you very much, Thanks, Sean everyone. and Scott. Really appreciate it. Okay, next to talk to you is Matthew Putland, and um, he's going to talk about digital signage and wayfinding.
great stuff that we're hearing today in the conference. Okay, so, um, Ross, over to you, Ross. Chatbots and, uh, and conversational user interfaces are one of the emerging technology trends. Now, nowadays, everyone seems to be using one or embracing one. But as this adoption has been happening uh, quickly, unless we understand some of the accessibility challenges, we will continue to build ever more complex digital services which aren't accessible. For those of you in the room not necessarily understanding what a chatbot is, a chatbot is a program which often sits on websites. When activated, it provides human-like responses to questions from the user. But it's not just confined to a website. They're also found on other digital platforms, such as Facebook, Slack, or Skype. A well-created, Accessible website which follows best practice, accessibility support, can very quickly be undermined by providing an inaccessible chatbot. To maintain accessibility on our sites, we need to follow several accessibility principles when we build and deploy chatbots. Six sub principles which we need to follow are we need to choose a customizable platform. We need to ensure the conversation history is navigable, it's identifiable, conversations are announced, and we also need to make sure all rich media, which is returned, is also accessible. The most important principle is to choose the correct platform. All of these accessibility issues can be quickly fixed by finding and buying the right platform. And the right platform will allow us to build in that really, really solid accessibility support right from the start. There are plenty of bot platforms available and many provide pre-built web components which allow us uh, to drop it in onto our website and with minimal ease and minimal configuration have a working, a working chatbot. This approach sounds wonderful, but it does come with significant drawbacks. This ease of installation comes with a significant disadvantage. Many of these controls have poor or non-existent accessibility support. They may use non-standard controls, have irregular tab ordering, poor color contrast, and lack ARIA support to announce the changes in content to screen readers and other assistive technology. If you've begun developing chatbots and, you, and you're now starting to think, am I accessible or not? One of the best ways and, what, and what, uh, one of the easiest ways is to look at what you've made visually. If you've built a bot using the Microsoft bot framework and you have a control on your website which looks like this on the screen. So on the screen is the standard Microsoft bot framework web chat to control. If you've got that, there, there is a very strong likelihood of you already having significant accessibility challenges. But that's not necessarily to say all of these all of these uh, controls are problematic. Now, some of these may have really good accessibility uh, support, but before recommitting to development and locking yourself in, into building on a less than ideal uh, platform, test the controls and test against accessibility guidelines. Software vendors at times have very bold and uh, liberal statements of accessibility uh, conformance. So uh, treat everything with an open mind and a pinch of salt. Uh, the, uh, the accessibility which they offer might be really, really good or might be really bad, but you won't know unless you test. So 
a test with your internal staff, a test with external staff, a test with accessibility, your professionals, just to give you that strong, unbiased feedback that what you're looking at to buying is accessible and is the best for you. A good bot platform will allow you to create your own, uh, your own custom UI. The closer you get to creating an interface in HTML, CSS, using standard elements in a standard way, the more accessible it will be. Standard elements such as links, buttons and form elements all have native uh, support in screen readers and assistive uh, technology, which means all that standard uh, good stuff about state, about action, how they work, is, al is already being handed, handled to default by the assistive uh, uh, technology. When we uh, create a simple user interface using standard elements, we have the best chance of accessibility being built into it. It's also easy, easy to assume that everyone uses, uh, uses the mouse and not to consider other forms of input to devices. But some users may have a preference towards using a keyboard. So make sure all messages in the converse conversation history can be reached from the keyboard. Add the attribute to tab index equals zero on every message response. This allows a keyboard user to tab through the entire conversation history without having to use the mouse. On screen now is, is a conversation excerpt describing a typical bot conversation. The bot asks, can they book the user in for an appointment? The user agrees. The bot asks where their nearest branch is. And the conversation continues. The conversation though isn't what's important here. What is important is the tab ordering allows uh, allows a keyboard user uh, to tab through that message, uh, message sequence sequentially, alternating from the bot and the user, allowing them to understand how, how the messages are constructed and building up a bit of a, a, bit of a hierarchy. Every message needs to be uh, clearly identified. Is the message from the bot or from the user? Visually, we identify parts of the conversation by using indentation or other styling. But if a user can't see the screen, we need to provide another way. By using the ARIA label attribute, when each message receives a keyboard focus, it'll announce through the screen reader, through the screen reader, the bot said, followed by the message, or you said, followed by the message. It helps users who have difficulty identifying a relationship visually. On screen, we have a message from the bot which reads, what can I help you with? It's uh, contained in a development which has some nice styling and also has a tab index of zero, which means it's reachable in the keyboard tab sequence. And it has an ARIA label attribute. So when it receives the keyboard focus, the screen reader will announce the bot said, followed by what, what can I help you with? Visually, nothing's so different. However, it's this extra, extra code and extra attributes which we've added, which makes the screen more accessible to assistive technology users. It's a triggering extra supportive behavior on the screen reader. Point four, every update must be audibly announced. By using the ARIA Live attribute, whenever there is new text, this is announced to the screen reader. On screen, the parent container has ARIA Live assertive. And the div in a gray says, what can I help you with? This will be announced through the screen reader as this is new content. Whenever a new message is received, the, the container has more text added. Due to how we've implemented ARIA Live regions, 
it only announces the new content or what's changed, not necessarily the whole conversation history. There are at least uh, two values uh, to provide for the RE Live attribute, assertive and polite. Both of these values only announce new, new content through the screen reader, but the values change the priority of how the new content is announced. A value of assertive will announce the new content straight away, whilst polite pauses until other screen reader announcements are to finish before announcing the chatbot text. There, there may be instances where it's useful to allow the screen reader to finish reading out other text first before announcing new content. Several bot platforms now also return rich media in addition to plain text. Rich media is a content other than a text such as video or, or buttons which uh, trigger a response. And all of these rich cards also need to be made, it, made accessible. On screen are two rich media examples. Both are called the cards on the Microsoft bot framework. The first example is advertising Microsoft uh, Surface Pro 4 and has three buttons, a heading and some text. The other is describing Seattle, has an image, text, and a learn more button. When we make these rich cards accessible, we also, we also need to make sure images have appropriate alt text. Headings are properly structured, buttons are keyboard accessible, and links have a logical focus order. Ensure how the items are laid out visually on screen is the same way they'll be interacted with within the keyboard ordering sequence. Point six, provide a skip link which allows a user to bypass on-screen content and navigate directly to, to the chatbot. Many your chatbots are featured in the lower left or upper right of the screen. Without an easy way you know, to navigate to, you know, to this region, a user would have to tab through all the page links before they reached the, the, the chatbot. A skip link is a, is a convenient way for them to shortcut to, to, to the chatbot and reduce the keyboard interaction. The Australian uh, tax office have a on their skip links, a skip to Alex virtual assistant, which bypasses all of the content heavy homepage and navigates directly to the chatbot. Accessibility though, doesn't just end at these six principles. Also ensure that the conversation history is pitched at an appropriate level. There's a good color contrast between the background color and the foreground text color. And the focus order shows the most recent message first. It's not necessarily about reducing the screen design to something simple and unattractive. It's about providing a solid skeleton of accessibility support which works for everyone, regardless of their own challenges. When developing a chatbot, make sure you test these principles with users to confirm that you're, ac you're actually delivering an accessible experience. We've made uh, some assumptions here with best practice accessibility uh, support, but uh, testing with users is the best way to actually uh, determine our hypothesis and whether what we think works actually does work and is made in the best possible way for the user. Microsoft Bot Framework is one of the most, uh, one of the most configurable for platforms if your redevelopment is centered around the .NET architecture. And no, this isn't a sneaky paid promotion. But avoid using the out of the box web chat to, web chat to control pr provided by Microsoft because any bots you produce using this control won't be accessible. Building your own, uh, your own uh, UI in HTML, CSS, JavaScript, 
with ARIA attributes will give you the best possible outcome with accessibility. And the BOT framework provides this flexibility. Many BOT frameworks offer fantastic potential for truly delivering accessible experiences for people with disabilities. But this means absolutely nothing if the core of a product, the web chat, isn't, isn't accessible. Anecdotally, I've heard uh, through my workplace how there is an aspiration to look at adding speech to, speech to text or voice recognition. But before embracing this, uh, this, uh, this bleeding edge of technology, ensure that the web chat so the basic, the basic element of a chat is accessible. Build and test to, to WK2 and other suitable accessibility standards and test with users. A further, a further challenge to make accessible are voice-based UIs. Amazon Alexa, Apple's Siri and Hey Google are voice-based UIs and this will become much more much more pervasive, where instead of interacting visually, we interact through speech. What are some of the challenges with speech? People with a speech disfluency, such as stutters, accents, English as a second language, all need to be uh, uh, considered when designing the experience. I myself have a stutter. Stuttering is a disfluency in the pattern of speech. It can be mild or, or severe and is often contextual based. It's uh, characterized by long pauses, elongated words, hesitations or blocking on words or sounds. And also if many of you were in, uh, were in uh, Jerry's workshop yesterday, there was a discussion uh, surrounding a viral uh, social media post of a spoon which has been uh, developed for people with, with hand, to, hand to tremors, where uh, traditionally the tremor would make it very hard for people to feed themselves. But uh, this spoon introduced vibration which would uh, cancel out the tremors in uh, the hand, rendering what was previously a very a difficult way of feeding oneself for, to make it easy. And this is something voice UI manufacturers need to uh, consider. Building in suitable for tolerances so within their speech based to vo voice so UIs where instead of accepting the spoken words uh, straight away, there's a, uh, there's a buffering effect which can uh, cancel out blockages or, or spaces in the, the conversation. Uh, but just as the case with web accessibility, when we build for the more for challenging human conditions, everyone benefits. And this is equally true with speech capability. If we build with suitable uh, tolerances in the software to, to ignore the gaps in speech, the misspoken repetition or blocks, then it means the people using mobile uh, devices in noisy environments, in clubs, in bars, people who, eat, who even have a sore throat, and people who are uh, distracted or benefit. When we build and to design for the, for the extremes, it means everyone benefits. Truly human-centered to design. There are really good pockets of bot to design within a government, but as it is an emerging technology, this list is somewhat limited. However, the ATOs, Alex and IP Australia, are both re uh, really good examples of good accessible bot uh, uh, design. Building an accessible chatbot may seem, may seem daunting, but it's not. I've, I've put up onto GitHub the full source code for Fenton, which is an accessible UI for Microsoft-based chatbots. 
And I've also got several information cards on me, which I'm happy to hand out afterwards. And I'm happy to take any questions. Actually, sorry, if we can just hold questions for the moment, um, that'd be great. We're, uh, we, we, we do need to head off to lunch. But Ross, you'll be around for lunch? Certainly. Excellent. So please hit Ross with questions over, over lunch. If we can come back, if we can aim to be back for 1.30, that'd be great. And at 1.30, Sarah Pullis from Intopia is going to talk to us about accessible design systems. That should be a fascinating talk. Um, also, if you're not, in, in case you're not going to be here tomorrow, can you please make sure that you leave your badge either with one of the volunteers or at the registration desk? Thank you very much. See you at 1.30. Which is on level three and oh, okay lunch will be served on the dot strong cafe on level three we can get there via the lifts either from the bottom here or if you're up can we do it from upstairs no no so come down the bottom and go up at the lift level three <laughs>